Yeah, how I hoped. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for your patience. Um, well, uh, my talk is called Parts of Blender are Chain Driven, as you can see. And what I want to talk about is something which I think is um, very important for Blender and for the community, which is how to reinforce the chain which connects uh, people who perhaps don't even know about Blender or CG right the way through the, the talent chain right to the end where you would say at the opposite end are the super experts and shall we say the Blender gurus of the world. Um, let me just get a handle on where the hell my mouse is. There we go. So uh, I'm going to talk about myself for a few seconds just so that you know who I am and how I got here. Then there'll be a short bit of a short film, or possibly all of a short film. Uh, there'll be a little bit of a discussion about how it ended up being called the 3D Movie School Club, because at the beginning it wasn't. It was called Animation Club. Um, what's different about the model? What could happen next? What needs to happen in order for what could happen next to happen? And uh, at any time, just jump right in. Um, so my name's Pete Dakin. I currently have a day job. I work in a media and publishing company in London where I look after um, all things digital for that business. Uh, and I manage a team of technical developers, basically. Um, previously, uh, I was with an educational software business in London where I managed a team of developers. And I first met up with Blender in 2009 when I was looking for a kind of a, a free video editing solution. So I wasn't really thinking about 3D animation or anything like that. I just was annoyed with the corporate IT where I worked because they had blocked me from installing Microsoft Movie Creator and I wanted to edit a movie. So that's how I discovered Blender by Googling. Um, so the motivation for me started more recently uh, in, in this year when in my current job I was trying to just figure out how to make a cool logo. So I knew about Blender obviously by now and had been tinkering around with it usually on my daily commutes um, on the train and I was trying to work out how to get this logo to work and it actually wasn't that hard, it was all coming together in my head. But at the same time in my life, my daughter was 11, coming to the end of primary school, and I'd also, in trying to figure out that thing, had also discovered that thing, which was done by Richard van der Roost, and I thought, that was so cool, wouldn't it be great if I could do something at her school, maybe by showing them how to do that, and somehow getting that thing in there as well. Um, I, I kind of imagined myself making the next Transformers movie with a bunch of child prodigies. That's how it sort of coalesced in my mind. Um, and maybe we were going to add some lightsaber battles or some T-Rexes or spaceships or something up in the sky. I don't know. There, there was no limit. But unfortunately, my ambition was quickly terminated, as it were, by several major roadblocks. Um, I, I had a bit of a dilemma on my hand because on the plus side of the ledger, I had this amazing free software at my fingertips. Um, I had this amazing free model, which I was able to download from blendswap.com. Uh, I had signed up to CG Cookie, where I understood uh, Richard had posted some tutorials and they were affordable. And as soon as I looked at them, I thought there's no way I can assimilate all this new knowledge in the amount of time I've got available and with my debatable abilities of the particle logo effect. <laughs> this seemed like a quantum leap. So on the minus side, I realized the transformer was too complex for the kids to achieve in some kind of school club coaching context. It was too complex for me, um, especially given that I didn't have enough time to assimilate the know-how. And this here would, be, would have been what I rendered it on anyway, which clearly isn't adequate. So 
I had these difficulties um, and I didn't want to not do it just because of there were some downsides. So I, I kind of took them as challenges and I thought, well, how am I going to solve them? So the complexity issue, I thought, well, the first thing is you've got to simplify it. You've got to make it fun, probably make it less about Blender and more about making a movie because there's more to making a movie if it's a visual effects movie than just animation, isn't there? There's getting out there and being active and holding a camera, filming and all of that sort of stuff. Um, too complex for me was meant I was going to have to ask somebody to help me. So fortunately, Blender community is a, a great community. You only have to go online and see how willing everybody is to help everybody. Um, I figured I should reach out. Uh, I didn't have enough time, so I was just going to have to figure that one out <laughs> and drink more coffee or something. And um, the hardware problem was insurmountable in terms of I couldn't just ask somebody for a render farm, but I did. Um, so what I ended up doing was uh, contacting Richard van der Roost and getting his agreement to assist along with CG Cookie who um, sort of loaned someone called Paula who does a bit of writing for CG Cookie um, to me and basically just as somebody to talk to um, for moral support and to keep me and Richard kind of focused on things uh, and then we just made this movie so would you like to see what it turned out like. Well, this is, first of all, I'm going to bore you with the process. Okay, so hopefully this is where the sounds kick in. Let me just, um, oh my god, full volume, you don't want that. Try about there. Okay, there's no sound. Pumping, uplifting music should be playing. Um, so in, in the first week, I went to the school. I didn't really have much of a plan. Bullet points basically sums it up. We shot the outside playground scene where the transformer would land. The kids were absolutely manic. I bought a green screen on Amazon for 25 quid and took it along just because it was a cool thing to take along to a school club. Uh, we never ended up using it in real terms, but it was there. Um, you know, can see how excited they were. Uh, week two, we did storyboarding, but the storyboarding was pretty primitive. It was about saying to the kids, did you know that we storyboard stuff? get a piece of paper and a pencil and let's work through this script that we're going to invent and the, so they spent lesson two not touching blender lesson one not touching blender but being active and having fun and being inspired um, by the process and being excited by it um, I also discovered that's my rendering that's sorry that's my tracking effort at, at the end of week two there that oh, I can't do tracking it is really hard I, I was really confident with my, I had this Sony camera phone thing and I held it as steady as I could and I told the kids where to walk in that top scene so that they didn't come in front of where the car would be and I thought I'd done it steadily enough and you know I'd watched a tutorial by someone called Oliver Villar, I think his name is, um, all about tracking a, a, a basketball playground with a monkey's head, maybe some of you have seen it. And I thought, oh, I can just do this. And then I did it, and it was awful. And it took me two weeks of just night after night trying to retrack it and getting the solve error down and thinking I was doing well. Sent it off to Richard van der Roost to add the, just to do his bit, which was just add the transformer. And he was like, dude, I can't use that. It's horrible. So he did it with some Richard van der Roost magic and managed to make my terrible um, photography turn into a tracked object which seems to be stuck to the ground. Um, I went back and hit the books that night and found another tutorial called Track Match Blend by um, Sebastian Koenig and sponsored by Blender I guess. Fantastic. I recommend it to anybody. Went and did some simple kind of tracking stuff with dots on a piece of paper and we managed to do some tracking so it just goes to show if you, if you hit the right books <laughs> you can get a good result. Then Richard de delivered um, the transformer back to us, and in week four, the kids got to uh, play around with a bit of tracking, but the main thing we did was we just looked at what the result had been 
and I'm teasing it because you know, I can show you the whole movie now, but I don't want to. Um, we just spent ages just looking at the, the footage over and over again. Like in the second one, you can see that you know the, through the glass of the car at the real world behind the glass, and there's a little bit of refraction going on. The kids were actually really absorbed by how this was even possible because they knew that they'd just been in the playground and there was nothing there. And then suddenly this thing was in the playground with them and Jake, the kid in white there, his reflection is in the paint. Oh, that's just not possible. <laughs> so, but there it is. So, so the kids were absolutely amazed and so was I. And in that one up there you can see the shadow of the transformer as it lands is on the roof of the school. So all those little details Richard added in. Um, so basically he did all the hard work for me. Um, and he gave me back 20 seconds or so of rendered footage for me to add into the, the whole movie. So then we progressed on and we did the rest. The kids were shown how to learn what I'd learned, which was how to make particle text go boom, which is actually pretty easy. It's about 20 steps. So that was pitched perfectly at, at the level of the kids. Um, then we spent the sixth week filling in some gaps. By this point, we realized that we couldn't make the whole thing according to the original idea that we'd had, which was to make a kind of a dream scene. So we ended up making a documentary about kids who were learning Blender when one of them goes off into a daydream and dreams of Transformer Lens. So it kind of worked in the end. We just figured out how to make it into five minutes of movie. Um, the last day we just spent finishing off and we put all the kids work into the final credits um, now I did plug my sound in and I did turn my volume up so would you like to see the movie now right okay so I'm glad you said that because I'm going to show it to you anyway <laughs> um, I'll get the player over onto here and then if I do this so far so good. I'm hoping there'll be some sounds. There's no sound. That's disappointing. Bear with me. I'll just what I'll do is I'll just turn my um, my laptop speaker up loud. It's probably the worst way of all to... It's just not outputting any sound, is it? Well, that's the demo effect, as they call it, isn't it? So I've got HDMI plugged in and the audio plugged in and my sound up. Um, hmm, I would have thought it would just output out of my own PC speakers. Mixer. I've got everything turned up. Device. going to go to plan B because I do have backup. This is actually comes out in, in a later part of my presentation. That it always pays to have a plan B because it's almost certain that nothing will go according to plan. <laughs> and there's no sound on YouTube either. Okay, well, okay. Do I do the sound effects? <laughs> she says, if you said to me we could make a 3D movie, I wouldn't have believed you because it's really hard, and yet we did it. She says, it takes a big team to make a 3D movie. Words to that effect. Then there's a voiceover of a kid saying that we did some 
match moving stuff. And they had to, they played with all of this. That's Richard's transformer there. And you know it's shaky and, and it's rough and it's not perfect. But because kids have done this, um, and there is a soundtrack to this, it does sound really nice. Very disappointing that it's not working at all. Um, and you can see that they're all kind of just mucking around at their own level. There's no pressure on them here to sort of achieve a level. There's no time pressure. They don't have to complete by a deadline. This takes place over seven or eight weeks, an hour and a bit each session. Um, it's coached by me, or you know, proxy of me is basically someone who's not very good at Blender, um, with an expert in the background providing the necessary to, to give them something exciting um, to look back on. So for, for me, this whole process here is about the inspiration of we did something with 3D software, because these kids are 11. Now they're at secondary school. They've just started. They can't really focus on their careers. They're not really thinking, gee, I hope I don't forget all that stuff I learned in Blender. But they do know that they did something in Blender. Using it, it was really cool. It took a big team. Some of them they never met. Building up now. So the girl's gone off into a daydream, Hannah. That's the, uh, the cutaway, there she goes. She says, imagine if one landed right here. He pretends to be a transformer. You can see where this is going. It's all building up. It's all inside her daydream now. It should probably be going like this. I can't quite figure out how to do that. Um, so they're outside, just, this was shot on the last day because I didn't have enough bits of stuff to stick into the story to make it all glue together in time with the free soundtrack that I downloaded off YouTube. So uh, now you can hear the daydreaming girl going, Transformer, Transformer, and here it comes. He's going, well you can tell he's there. Boom. So, so this is the bit Richard did. Which I think you agree, looks amazing. Because I didn't do it. Um, that's my gorilla pod. That didn't come in very handy at all. My, uh. So then um, they wake her up out of her daydream, and um, I'll, I'll fast forward it a bit now because basically um, the end. You see the credits roll. And this is where the work that the children actually did plays out, and you get to see the um, <laughs> you get to see something. Probably going to download everything from there to there now. Oh, you get to see the particle effect text. They each of them made their own name, so they're focusing on themselves, which children love to do. Um, and. as well. <laughs> um, so the kids all made their names basically. Um, that kept them interested for the amount of time I needed them to be interested and got them exposed it to the Blender kind of machine without giving them too much to actually have to achieve. I'll just kill that. Um, so there you go. We made the movie. Uh, just me, a dad, some crazy kids, and luckily uh, a professional. A and all the time that that was going on, um, I was kind of whirling away thinking th this could be a thing. Um, this could work for, it could scale. Um, on one level, it could have been just the end. When it got to the end of the process, it could have been the end of the story, and it still could be. Um, but you know, the reason I've come here today is to present the process and to do a bit of networking. One more minute, because the other guy overran quite a bit. Um, so I, I learned quite a bit about the process. And 
it had dawned on me, really, that um, there is a continuum of, of know-how and, uh, and skill, starting with the newbies and ending with the gurus. I'm about there, probably, I reckon. Probably a self-taught person. Or, you know, I haven't done higher education, animation studies or anything, but I've taught myself a bit, mainly by watching Andrew Price tutorials and stuff like that. <laughs> Um, and becoming discouraged at my own lack of ability. Um, but, it, you know, along that continuum, you've got kind of three groups. You've got your beginners, you've got your mid-levels, and you've got your experts. Pretty much normal continuum of learning. Um, and, and this could form the basis of a club model. Um, in fact, there are other stakeholders here, though. There are these guys on the top line who have something to be interested in to do the school clubs. Parents want educational, engaging, safe and affordable things for their kids to do after school until they get picked up at five o'clock. Um, the other guys want similar things, but they also would like them to be aligned with some sort of educational kind of standards. Um, then you've got these guys, and these are the things that they want. You know, kids want to have fun and maybe learn something and brag about it. Coaches probably want to upskill themselves as well as the kids and probably want to get paid um, unless they're volunteers. My discussion today is about not the volunteering types but the types who would like to be paid. So the money comes from schools and parents. Parents pay for their kids to go into after school clubs in the UK, probably in other countries as well. Um, and the money arrives eventually with the coach. This could be any school club model. It doesn't have to be about animation. It could be Minecraft, robotics, sewing, anything. But as soon as you add Blender into the mix and you have experts like Richard van der Roost who say, yeah, I'm prepared to lend three days of my time, but I'm a pro, you've got to pay. So that's fine. Should be paid. Deserves to be paid. Did something awesome. Um, and then you have Blender itself now they may not be interested in school clubs, but they've got an agenda. They want to be funded. They want to um, be well regarded and be in the front of mind when it comes to pipeline for small teams and individuals, according to <laughs> the vision statement. So then, if you were going to make a club using all of those things, you could not rely on it all just organically happening, because it just can't happen. And it can't be just one person or just two people who just try to do it, because it can't scale. But what you need is something that takes the responsibility for coordinating the clubs and essentially an umbrella which hires the talent. Um, the school won't hire someone because they have taxation responsibilities and all that nonsense. So you need someone to act as an umbrella, and that's where I felt something like 3D movie schools as a club concept would work. So it would fit into the kind of universe of all of these things. And so, some questions. Was this about education or a, an activity? What do you guys reckon? A bit of both, yeah. But there's no curriculum. I reckon it's just about having fun and doing something inspiring. Um, was it about Blender or making movies? Personally, I think it was about making movies, using Blender when you had to. Um, should it have been more technical? Could it have been more structured? Was it self-paced? I would say no. This is one of the major differences. Things like um, the CG Cookie type of tutorial model, it's all self-paced learning, which where at the end of it, you get to know how to do something, but you don't get like a rubber stamp that says you have a qualification or something like that. Probably you could stick it on your CV and say that you've done it. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, can you restate that? Yeah, I mean, those are very complex uh, things. Like yes. Blender, Blender, exactly. Uh, it's super cool. Thank you. But it's possible. It, it, is, it is possible, and to me, it's really exciting that take something and demystify it, something as complicated as Blender and the whole pipeline of everything um, and just demystify it to the point where kids just go, Blender's cool. 
And, you know, there's no pressure to achieve. They knew what Blender was by the end of it. Um, it did enhance a bit of collaboration between community members. And, you know, they all know now when they watch a movie, they don't know about Maya, they don't know about ZBrush, they don't know about any of that stuff. When they see the Avengers, they say, that was done in Blender, fake, <laughs> or something like that. You know, that's, that's where the mind is. This is the same model um, that Apple uses. Probably there's a bullet point up there about that. But, you know, oh, yeah, it's the third one down. So, you know, Apple likes to get its iPads. Yes. And this is why I think uh, this model, if it was actively supported by the community and Blender kind of got on board and said, you know, this brand, this group, this collective is what we endorse in schools, then you have that kind of foundation level support that's driving in schools. You can go in there and you can say, we're supported by this software foundation. Um, you know, it's free. There's no entry barriers for the schools. Schools love that kind of stuff. Um, everybody wins. Your parents win. Their kids are being engaged, inspired. You know, they're getting value. They're not just being babysat. Um, kids get something. The teachers love it. Schools, well, you should have seen the head teacher's eyes just lit up. Um, the Blender community wins because the coaches and the experts are also getting some kind of additional funding because everybody likes to be paid at the end of the day. Um, collaboration and partnership is vital. I kept adding to the list actually about an hour ago, so I apologize. I just was ranting by the time I got to this. Um, so uh, um, there is another video, but I'm not going to show it because it won't work. Um, but you know, essentially, I believe that the model uh, of the 3D movie school clubs, whether it's that brand, is conceptually quite sound. Um, and anybody who wants to talk to me about, you know, how we could work together, I'll be happy to shake a hand or three or more, hopefully, um, by the end of Sunday. Um, that Mission Impossible that ties into the movie, I'm not going to show you. I'm really sorry. You know that scene in Mission Impossible when Tom Cruise is hanging out the airplane? It does look pretty cool. Um, yeah. Probably works without sound. If I have an internet. There we go. We did this in one hour. Me and my kids. Tom Cruise needed a whole airport, an actual aeroplane. <laughs> <laughs> that was, if you ever do see that again on YouTube or something, there's a little piece of my banister in the scene because we couldn't cover it up. <laughs> I couldn't be asked, masking it out. So, yeah. So there you go. Um, that explains that. And um, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Would anybody like to ask anything or... Oh, now it works! <laughs>